Hello and welcome back to the channel. It's uh, me, Gooda, and it's time for Getting Lost with my good friend. Dan, we shall do no harm to Lost this week. Very good, very good. Yeah, so this week we learned that no character is safe and we're quite happy to dispatch main cast members. Uh, and we, we, certainly, we certainly do. And, um, you know, it was a, a cast member that we've been l learning to love so much so far. <laughs> certainly haven't been slagging off this particular cast member pretty much every episode of this podcast at this point. I, I think clearly we were right because, like, Boone's got to try and be pretty productive and the island has struck him down and gone, no, yeah. that's not your place, Boone. <laughs> Bad Boone, how dare you do something useful last episode? We must get rid of you. Yeah, so obviously the, the driving thing here is is Boone uh, slowly dying and Jack's efforts to to try and save him. And yep. we learn more about a bit more about Jack through through that and obviously the, the flashbacks. Um, with the main kind of th thing being of Jack does not know when to give up on something. Yeah. I mean, and, and that's something we, we've seen before. I mean, I think the, the, I mean, the thing that got me in the flashbacks was just the, uh, and I don't know why it came as a complete shock, was just the fact that Jack is married or has been married or yeah. not quite sure. Because um, there's been no reference to him having been married up to this point. No, not not at all. Um, and th th this was a we this was a slightly weird. Um, thing from my perspective, watching a show that is uh, 16, 17 years old, I guess, the, the, set, the, the ones we're watching at the moment, yeah. where um, the, previously when we've had a guest in there that I've seen before, the, the obvious one was, um, I've forgotten her name, but played De, um, De, Delenn. Um, Mila Ferlin, yeah. Mila Ferlin. We've had um, Patrick. Yeah, and you have that history associated with that actress all right, yeah. This is the kind of exact opposite in that, um, what's it, uh, Julie oh, Bowen right. turns up as the wife. And now me sitting here in 2020, I've had so many episodes of her in Modern Family as Claire. <laughs> I've got this like future um, Julie Bowen is fixated in my mind as what her character is. Yeah, yeah just, that was just the kind just of imagine, interesting... Imagine uh, Modern Family with... Uh... With the switch and the husband, <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. So, presumably, uh, uh, like, uh, I don't think she'd done particularly much, presumably, at this point. Um, I think by this point, yeah, she was somebody that you could potentially recognize by this point. Um, she'd been in like quite a few TV series, but kind of for like it's those kind of things where she was in like three, four episodes of a thing, right? Yeah, Not, like a main role in yeah, yeah. anything, but she'd been in well, today she's just so well known as. You know, Claire from Modern Family. That it's just interesting, sort of going back and viewing her through a lens that I shouldn't have if I was watching the series for the first time. I think she was actually um, in an episode of Party of Five, which obviously was Matthew Fox's. Oh, uh, okay. Right. Before Lost, right? But yeah, I see what you mean. Like, it, it is one of those. It's unfortunate. Uh, it's nothing the production can help, but like, no, not, <laughs> not at all. It's a bit of a yeah, it's a suspension of disbelief breaker because you're so like distracted by the. And, and it, I don't think it's like, you know, I don't think it detracts from the episode. It's just that because fortunately she's playing the role of, you know, loving wife-to-be, which isn't going to particularly be a problem for the modern family watchers nowadays. But yeah, it's just something that, oh, oh, it's her. And so she did have a connection to one of the numbers. She did have a connection to one of the numbers, did she? Uh, I don't think I picked up on the connection to one of the numbers. When she was in her pajamas. She's got 40, it's got the, her pajamas have got 44. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> I think I spotted that one. Oh, is that when she's playing the piano? When yeah, you... so that's the little bit where they, she comes yeah. and, okay, yes. and, yeah. and like, as she walks away, like yeah. a big 44 on her back. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so they sneak them in, like these numbers. <laughs> yeah. I, I think that, like, chances are what they, I mean, that, that there's going to be lots of occasions where the numbers are just snuck in. But I, I think I probably won't care too much about those, like just spotting them. But I think uh, uh, when it's like I can see a connection maybe between them, I think is more where it's... Yeah, I think that's. I think I've kind of said it before. This is, I think, one of the things they play around with a little bit where they'll sneak the numbers in and sometimes they're relevant and, and sometimes, sometimes they're just kind of like coincidental yeah. <laughs> kind of things because I think they know they can play with their audience a little bit and kind of have people going, oh, but this was on... Like her back, is that relevant? Yeah. Like, no, not really. 
It's rather in the fact that we've made you try and think about it and fit it into your theory. Yeah. But yeah, the, the, I mean, this episode is kind of classic lost in structure. Um, I think in this instance, like, I think there's a bit more detachment between the stuff you learn in the flashbacks and the stuff that's going on in the island. There is a little bit of a carryover in terms of the whole concept of commitment, um, yeah. which think- is the thing that sort of travels between the two. And this is, I think, we, it's a little bit different here because this is, I think, like the third time we've seen a Jack yep. flashback. So obviously we already know quite a lot about Jack. So I think that's why the kind of flashbacks don't necessarily relate directly to like what's happening on the, the island. Yeah. Um, but I still, the, the flashbacks are still interesting. I say that the, the, the immediate thing was I was like, oh, Jack's married was a little bit of a shocker. Um, the fact that at that point in time, which again, it's always difficult with the flashbacks to try and place where does this fit in in terms of the timeline. But he seemed to have a fairly amicable relationship with his dad. Yes. There. Um, so we, you know, we pitches it before the big bust yeah, up about the surgery. If anything, this is probably the earliest in Jack's timeline, I would suggest. Yes, because we've only had, well, uh, ignoring like the kid bit in. Yeah. The, uh, yeah. Cause we've had him. Yeah. We've had him like falling out over the botched surgery. Yeah. We've had him having to go and try and find his yeah. dad. So the assumption is this has got to be like a few years before yeah. that, um, but it's difficult to say when. Um, but it was it was good to sort of see the Jack and his dad interaction going on, and basically his dad making it quite clear that you know he understands Jack in that he's very, you know he's very good at the commitment side of things. He's very bad at letting go. Um, yeah, I think that kind of keys into the, what we've discussed before, like the idea that Jack's dad wasn't necessarily being an awful father for Jack. It, he was kind of trying to express something yeah. that he really believed was best for Jack, but just doing it really poorly. Yeah. Um, the thing, One of the things that, that crossed my mind on it is, is I was... I, I don't think it's as unusual, particularly in the US or nowadays, but the fact that Sarah was the one giving the speech at the wedding was noticeable because normally that's the actual father of the bride's role to do that. So I picked up on that and was like, oh, I wonder if she's got some kind of daddy issues going on, like doesn't have a father or something. Um, I mean, it's not totally uncommon, but generally speaking, it's, you know, I think it was the Was that not the vow? No, she was, because she was doing the speech at the, in rehearsal dinner. Oh yes. Yeah. That, yeah. Sorry. That bit. Yeah. That was the bit I was sort of, Oh, that, it's interesting that she's the one doing it because uh, under old school traditional we- weddings, the bride never does a speech. And I was like, oh, the bride's doing a speech. And I went and I wonder, normally that role is done by her father. And so I was like, oh, is there possible Sarah there- daddy issues going on yeah. as well? More more father child issues, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think the main, well, yeah. So the main thing you get from the flashback is the idea that Jack doesn't know when to, to let go. Yeah, of something, but you get some other intriguing bits like um, we get a bit some subtle signposting about drinking problems again. Yep, because uh, you see him with the the whiskey when they're at the piano, but then later on he's got a bottle of something, yeah, some clear liquid, which yeah, we suppose vodka or something. That's not normal behaviour to like presumably ask the bar in the hotel to just give you the bottle and then sit there drinking out of it. And yeah. probably not the thing to do, you know, night before your wedding. But uh... and I think the the bits where he's got doubts about why he's marrying Sarah yeah. are quite, for me, interesting because it's kind of am I just marrying her because I like got her better and I'm just not being able to let go of this patient? <laughs> yeah, the, 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 there's that whole sort of sequence, and Jack's dad like it doesn't quite. Um, steer him away from it but like what he says is that you know commitment is what makes you tick you're just not good at letting go almost implies yeah that's exactly what you're doing (laughs) yeah if if you read it just literally while it seems quite supportive in terms of his decision making it is basically almost reinforcing the doubt um that jack is expression expressing to him I, i i also like found it somewhat intriguing that we've got in the form of Sarah, 
someone who, at least on some level, must have mirrored Locke in some way, in that she was apparently paralysed and couldn't walk, or that was the... Yeah. Um, and I don't know if that sort of comes back around, that there's some kind of connection to what's going on, on, on with Locke, but it was just interesting that she sort of described Jack as the one who fixed her um, somehow. Yeah. And so I was just, that was, was all, ah, okay, there's a, there's a connection to Locke. It does crop up again in some flashbacks um, without trying to say too much. And there are various theories about around out there about what happened to, behind her recovery. Right. Okay. There is more to come. There is more to come to that. Okay. Well, that, that's good because I was like intrigued by it because of just the way it was sort of portrayed. And um, the, the other thing that was interesting, just that kind of almost follows on from that, is that she obviously gives the speech sort of saying that, you know, the reason why I'm marrying you is that you're the one who fixed me. And when we finally get to the, the vows and Jack does the off the cuff remarks, yes. um, it's in, uh, you know, he basically says, that she that she was mistaken. Actually, he's been fixed her. She fixed him, and that immediately sort of like because like, we haven't seen anything of Jack apart from possibly the drinking issue, which she clearly hasn't fixed. That <laughs> so the question is, what has he? What internally? What is he vocalizing that he feels that she fixed of him as part of them getting together? Yeah, well, it's you wonder about that because you wonder how much she knows about perhaps his drinking. Because when they're in the kind of in the bar at the piano together, he's just got like one drink, which is fairly yeah. fairly normal. But as she kind of doing that dialogue and as she leaves, she does seem a little bit wary about him leaving him like in the bar by himself. Yeah, and, and, and actually, there is the like the conversation he has with his best man about, "Oh, Claire will pick up on you drinking if you yeah like all these beers before you do it." Um, and then yeah, and then when we do see him sat with that bottle, he sat by himself and he sat outside as well. Like he's kind of isolated himself to sit and do that. Yeah, I, I think to my mind the, the the like I found the flashback sequences in this episode mm -hmm. the sort of interesting part, um, and, it, and it's possibly down to the fact that it's covering an element you know an air element and a period of Jack's life that we hadn't previously seen and it's like oh okay there's this whole other thing going on and for me uh, at the end there's a very kind of small moment where Jack's on the beach and he's got the bag and he's got the bag that is full of the alcohol and you see him kind of start rummaging in that bag looking quite kind of Distress is not quite the right word, but he's clearly not in a good frame of mind. Yeah. Um, and he's kind of rummaging in the bag. And then Kate appears and asks if he wants to talk about what's what's happened. And he kind of stops looking in that bag and sort of goes back to a bottle of water he's got. So I think that's a little kind of telling moment where he's about to lapse back. Yeah, but the, I could definitely see that as being... So that's probably, I think that's all I've got on the flashbacks, but there's definitely a lot to sort of talk through in terms of like the on-island stuff as well. Yeah. Um, so you obviously have the, the the sort of, we've talked about it before in the flashbacks, we've talked about it before with Jack in, in there, you've got this most committed man ever known because he's determined not to let Boone die, he's doing absolutely everything. He's going to like transfuse his own blood. because, yeah. uh... And that there was the fact that... You, it, it, you've got this interesting, well, it's, it, it's a point of, of to note that oh, Jack's a universal donor in terms of the blood. Yeah. Well, of course he is, you know, because that's exactly what Jack is. <laughs> He's the one who's just giving, giving, giving. Um, I think there are some, uh, again, nice little character moments around, the, like the central drama of it. Like you see uh, in the first kind of, I guess like triage <laughs> stage, uh, Kate freezes, which is not yep. something it would expect necessarily of, of Kate. And Jack has to kind of get her to, like tells her what to do and she just kind of stops. Hurley doesn't freeze. Hurley has kind of got over his fear of blood and doesn't yep. paint and is like straight to like helping out. Um, when- Sun, Sun, Sun comes completely into her own. That's the... in there, yeah. And she, I think they're really, but I really like is when she's found the 
the needles from the sea urchin or sea urchin thing. What, it, well, what it was some kind of sea creature with spikes um i think a moment to pick up on in is sawyer like he doesn't obstruct kate in getting the alcohol off him he straight away he's like take it yeah yeah no I, i'd specifically noted that down that it was like he didn't give a single word of his usual banter. It's like he recognised, you know, he recognised something in Kate that, oh, yeah. this is not the time to be calling her freckles and all the other bits and pieces that he'd normally do. It's just, here you go. Yeah, there, there's a lot of those sort of bits and pieces. I mean, you get Charlie sort of, again, trying to help as much as he can, but sort of pushing Jack too much when he's sort of asking all the questions. Um, you have... Jin finally speaking to um, Sun again. That, that was a sort of yeah. a big important step in my mind where he's the one who, you know, he, he hears the call for help from Kate and Claire in the woods and runs out yeah. and gets there and manages to get past the, um, the language barrier. To yeah, a... And again, we can, we, we know that he's, he's picking up more English because he, you yeah. know, like he, no doctor, and that's the point where Kate's like, yeah, 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 yeah. And he, he sort of, you know, he can understand enough to say, you yeah, know, take this bag of stuff, take it to Jack, tell Jack to, uh, you know, come here. Uh, and he's actually the one, when they sort of get back to Claire, he's actually the one that kind of initially seems to help calm her down. Yeah. When Charlie's like talking to Kate, like behind him, and like Jin's just kind of, almost just kind of sat there looking at Claire, but that seems to be enough to kind of yeah, he, yeah, he sort of sort of says something to her in Korean that she presumably doesn't understand, but in a sort of sufficient way that she uh, relaxes and sort of accepts it. Um, and you know, you get a lot about Claire as well in that, that whole sequence. Like she's all you know, reluctant to have the baby because of all her own insecurities and fear yeah. about the right. baby. Up to the point where she's she's literally physically trying to like hold yeah. it. In at one point, um, and she, and, and it, 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 she had a couple of different fears, and some some of them you sort of go, okay, th those kind of make sense because she's sort of saying, you know, will the baby want me? Because I wanted to give it away. You've got her own self incrimination there, but you also have the um, vocalizing something that I sort of talked about a few episodes ago, which was she was saying, oh, you know, have they done something to the baby? Which was yes. one of my pet little theories that so far hasn't come to fruition that the uh, was it, what was the name of the character? Was it Ethan? Ethan, yeah. Yeah, Ethan and co. Did they, um, they, they, they seem to be sort of interested in the baby and we saw that sort of shot of um, them injecting something in there and it's like, oh yeah, you know, have they done something to the baby? Yeah. So yeah, that, that was an interesting thing that she particularly vocalised that one as well as all of the other concerns that she was having about having it. Um, I and think there's a fun, fun little bit where you, they kind of they they set it up almost like it's a birth being done in like a hospital, like maternity ward, because there's, there's Claire and Kate, and they're like off in a distance, but standing actually standing behind like a like a log or a tree or something. There's Charlie and Jim. yeah, and then Charlie like sees Claire kind of you know cry out in pain and like starts to go, and Jim just like holds him back and like just like shakes the bed is like no, don't go over there. And then, like, yeah, and Charlie's kind of pacing a little bit. So, like, it's kind of a classic maternity yeah. style. I like, I like that. Yeah. I mean, it, it, there's a few other things about that. Like, uh, I, I found it the fact that Jack effectively trusts Kate to deliver the baby was an interesting, you know, here's some very basic instructions. You've got this, <laughs> was effectively the. Well, that, that's, a, that's a true, like, Jack super doctor moment. It's like, he's explaining how to like deliver a baby while well, he's transfusing transfusing yeah. his own blood through a DIY transfusion setup that he's rigged himself. Yeah. <laughs> That's like super doc. Yeah. Um, yeah, and also the crucial thing that kind of comes to a head uh, here is the, is the fact that Locke lied and it's because Locke hasn't told Jack what yeah. happened. Essentially, it's probably not the only cause of Boone dying, but it's a big. Yeah. Part. And, and, and that was, again, I, I mean, we talked about it last episode was uh, 
in my mind, like it, it was an interest because he basically just says that very, very quickly, like he fell off a cliff and then just disappears. Um, clearly, if he hung around, he might give more info, at least more useful information. But yeah, certainly by the end of the episode, Jack's blaming Locke for the fact that, you know, it was clearly a crush injury as opposed to a fall injury, um, which makes a big difference in terms of how he would have treated him. Um, but there is also a bit of me that thinks that's probably a little bit of um, Jack trying to deflect his own yeah. you know, failings in terms of, well, maybe I could have saved him if I'd known this. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the episode sort of ends with Jack effectively saying, oh, he was murdered. Yeah. Which doesn't make a huge amount of sense. You know, I could, I, again, I think it's just sort of Jack reacting badly to his, his own yeah, failure. I, that's the way I read it. I think it's... I don't think it's Jack literally thinking Boone was murdered. Yeah. Jack. Otherwise, the fact that he's carried him however many miles back to for Jack to treat him just yeah. I think it is. I think it is just like Jack's way of vocalizing the fact that he's angry at Locke. Yeah, and he he, he think basically he's kind of saying that Locke murdered Boone by not telling Jack about Before. the crushing. Yeah. And you know, this is something that's been coming to a head for a while because I think I've said it many episodes. It's like so many problems would be solved just by how about you all just share all your secrets and then yeah. Well, I think you wouldn't have this a little bit in the in a little bit in there for Jack's reaction is that he like Boone has kind of told Jack about the hatch and that they've been going out to this hatch. Yeah, Locke's been keeping it a secret, so I think that yeah, I mean into it as well. In terms of information sharing, you've got. Jack has found out that there is a hatch of some description. He's found out about the plane because Boone tells him about the plane. Um, you also have Shannon telling Saeed about Boone and their relationship to some extent. Um, so that's, a di again, sort of additional information that's sort of been spread out. In interestingly, like, after having the cliffhanger of last episode... Locke isn't in this episode at all, I don't think. I don't yeah. think we see him at all. Don't see him at all, no. So you're kind of left wondering, you know, oh, did he get into his hatch? Did is he Yeah. Well, I think to be fair, like these are it's that kind of thing where sometimes with Lost it's hard to kind of gauge like the how much time is actually passing. Yeah. I mean, this is two episodes, but it's it's clearly happening from the end of particularly from like boom falling in the plane to like the end of this episode that's like a few hours of yeah it, it can't be more than a day that's taken place um like it, i i feel like it, it pretty much all takes place at night and then it we wake up in it's, it's in the morning when we see the new baby yeah like you know it's less than 12 hours or something that's taken place um, oh, so it's a bit of the, the classic television uh Television baby delivery, quite clean, apparently quite quick. <laughs> um, yeah, it's. I really liked the end sequence in this one because you have the juxtaposition of well, like initially you have like Claire and the the baby, and everybody's like crowding around and doing the kind of yeah, ah, oh, baby face. But then Jack sees Shannon, like and they come back, and, yeah, and like he immediately knows, oh, he's got to go and. Do his doctor giving the bad news thing, yeah. Um, and then I actually, there's the little bit that I thought was quite good as well, where like he Jack starts walking off uh, towards them, and he, then you see Kate like see Jack move off that way, and like she immediately knows, like and you can kind of see it on her face, like yeah, that's gutting. <laughs> this is you know bad that Jack has to tell her, and yeah, I mean you've got this, you know, there's the classic, oh one person has died and now we've got a new life that almost replaces them thing going on. I don't think there's much to that, either that, but just because they've killed off. Yeah, we've Steve? already, we've already uh, had. Yeah, a few people die, so. Background survivors die. Yeah. Um, but, and yeah, going back to that kind of end sequence, it's just, you know what's been said, but it's all done without any dialogue, which I think is really good. Yeah. I, I, I generally like that as a um, mechanic in film because it effectively allows the audience to do to get like what you get out of from reading a book versus watching a film in that your imagination fills in those blanks yeah. as you see fit so while you don't know exactly what 
Jack said to Shannon, you kind of you know what the, the gist is. Yeah. And you I think it's the it's it's tougher. Yeah, I like it in a lot of the time when you get this in performances. Like you kind of see Jack start walking off towards Shannon and Saeed, then it cuts back to the kind of the group around the baby, and then it cuts back, and Jack's not quite got to Saeed and Shannon yet, but Shannon is already visibly like distressed. Yeah. So you kind of know that as Jack's approached them, he's called out her name. And like from the way he said that, she's immediately like interpreted, this is not good. Yeah. And, and I think then is when you sort of see the shot of Kate looking at, yeah. at, at the whole thing. It's, it's sort of Kate's perspective of it. So yeah, it's, it's kind of like you, you fill, you, you, your mind fills in the blanks the best way that suits you. While if they just literally sort of cut too close up, Jack saying this has happened, Shannon, yeah. Yeah. then it wouldn't have actually had the same impact. Um, and then I think the next thing we see is Shannon standing over Boone's Yeah, body. then you kind of, you get um, like the last kind of few shots of the, the scene kind of cut between Claire looking down at the baby and Shannon yeah. looking down at Boone. Um, and yeah, and just, I remember like watching it like first time round for, I remember it being quite, like that ending was really impactful because not only is the kind of obviously the emotion of it, but you kind of sat there thinking, whoa, like a kind of opening cast list cast member, yeah, background survivor has been has been killed. Yeah. Here's the series kind of saying, you know, just because they got names, it ain't necessarily they're getting getting yeah. through this. I think I think in, in a similar vein to what we've just talked about. I mean, one of the things that I jotted down, and I, I jotted it down, my, my, my note is partly in jest, but um, I did look, did jot down that uh, useless Boone again fails in terms of he can't even deliver his final words. <laughs> yeah. He's only said, "Gets yeah. tell Shannon, oh, I don't," <laughs> and uh, mm, I, it's, yeah. it's it's slightly in jest in that you know Boone can't even you know. <laughs> Finish off it, 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 the final right. words, but actually, it, it, it's you know it's another example of that exact same mechanic whereby he hasn't said what his final words are. So as the audience, you sort of go, "Oh, what were they? Yeah. What were they?" And so you, you could be, yeah. You know, I think the vast majority of people would be thinking, "Tell you know, tell Shannon, I love you, I love her." Or, you know, he's going back to that all bits and pieces. But at the same time, you know, you, you can also view it as tell Shannon, I'm completely okay with you and Saeed. You just totally get together. Or, or tell, tell Shannon, yeah, bitch, if we hadn't had to go to Australia to find you, I wouldn't yeah. have been on this plane. So, so yeah, yeah. It, it, and it's been done, yeah, quite a few times before the final words not coming out. But uh, yeah, it, it did sort of cross my mind that again, it's another point where Lost is doing that thing where different audience members will have a different take on what he was going to say and yeah and then i mean what happens to poor boone it's quite grim throughout this episode because like he gets the collapsed lung yep he gets like the um they try to reset his leg which is clearly like really really painful <laughs> like because we hear him screaming even though like uh son has given him the the stick the stick to bite down on yeah yeah i mean it's it's pretty br brutal um in terms of and i guess actually now i'm thinking about it yeah it's kind of the second time as well for jack that he's had this experience on the island because he's had the same experience with the marshal where he marshal, tried to yeah. save the marshal but the marshal was just slowly dying over so many hours and it's effectively the same situation yeah i mean what what, what we're probably learning is jack's not that good of a doctor is <laughs> yes probably <laughs> can't save anybody yeah but yeah, it, it, it's one of those where certainly the you, you can understand why Boone has reached the point of just no, stop, stop <laughs> trying to save me. Had enough now, thanks. So yeah, oh, I was gonna... there's, there's a repeat of the uh, "Don't tell me what I can't do" line. I noted this, that down. This time it comes from Jack. Jack saying it, yeah. When which uh, when he's trying to save Boone, I think I think it was Son who said who sort of says you know. You can't do it. And uh, yeah. so, so I, I jotted that one down. So when, obviously, at the end of last episode and Boone gets gets hurt and Locke takes him to Jack, like, what did you, did you think Boone was going to survive? Yeah, I think at the end of, certainly at the end of that, that episode, it, it, 
I don't think you sort of cottoned on to how bad the injuries were at that point. The fact that Locke's done his Superman carry all yeah. the way back to, to Jack. Yeah, I, I was definitely approaching the beginning of the episode kind of assuming that he was going to be in a bad way, but would have been healed up in the, sort of, sort of by the end of this episode. Um, I think that changed pretty rapidly as the episode progressed. Yeah, yeah okay, no, he's not going to survive this one. Um, and I think that, the, you know, it, it made it more interesting, the fact that, you know, Locke has abandoned Boone, essentially, yeah. to go back to his precious hatch at that point. Um, and you've got that slightly problematic thing that on one side, you could see it from Locke's perspective that he's done all that he feels he can do, which yeah. is to carry him to the doctor. But actually, if he'd hung around and maybe given more information, maybe it might have gone a different way. So yeah, I, I mean, I'm certainly really curious as to what Locke's been doing for the last <laughs> twelve true. hours. Well, now that he's got his light on in his hatch, the rest of the cast, not all of them, are making this to the end. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I think that's probably the, the the fact we've had our first lead cast member killed off means that it's yeah, it's something that can happen. I think that's the yeah once you once you've established as a show yet yeah, we, we, we will kill off a main character if we feel that we want to that's always an important yeah thing to bear in mind and I guess you've also got like just thinking from a writing perspective like on one side you go well yeah they can't do too many of them because there's only a certain number of characters they've got to work with here but actually from last episode we've got a hint that oh there could be some more survivors so you know if we're running our characters we can just go and get a whole load of, load of other ones if necessary <laughs> Could always have another plane crash. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I mean, all of those people that gave Game of Thrones props for killing off main cast members <laughs> lost way ahead of the king. Well, I mean, so far they've just killed off one and he's pretty useless. So <laughs> let's see. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I do find it quite slightly amusing. That I, I can't remember how many episodes ago, but I'm pretty sure I said on this podcast that, you know, if they're, if they're going to kill off one main character, I was quite happy for it to be Boone. <laughs> oh, poor Boone. Yeah. So I feel slightly bad now, you know, poor Boone. I mean, he was useless. He didn't even get his, his final words out. He basically, but, well, last episode, I guess he did carry Locke somewhere successfully. So yeah, we have we have seen him like become a bit more, a bit more less than useless. Yeah. yeah um, but you, you, uh, thinking about the, the other thing, what that's interesting on the fact that he died is he still only passed on a really limited amount of information to Jack. I mean, he mentioned the plane, he yeah. mentioned the hatch. He didn't mention the radio transmission, the fact that, so we're yet again back to the notion that no one actually knows about who's on the other end of that radio. Yeah. Because one person, who, and Locke doesn't know about it because he wasn't in the plane. Yeah. So that, that information has died with Boone. So yeah, I mean, it goes back to if you share all the information wrong, everyone, then the island isn't going to kill you off because, you know. <laughs> <laughs> get, get, get sharing. I mean, to be fair, in terms of passing the radio stuff on to Boone, he did have a punctured lung and a fractured yeah. crushed leg at the time. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not blaming Boone for the, particularly for that one. I'm just saying that the, the information that we've acquired from the previous episode, that there is possibly other survivors now is purely known by the audience. It's not known by any of the yeah. characters. Yes, it's again, it comes back to that kind of interesting mix of uh, trying to keep track of what, as the audience, you know, yeah, what each different character knows. <laughs> yeah. Do some, uh, what do they call them? Um, oh, my mind's got completely blank. Uh, you know, the charts with the circles. Oh, um, Venn diagrams. Venn diagrams, need to do some Venn diagrams. I feel that, that some of these Venn diagrams will literally just be like a circle on their own and that's it. <laughs> just like oh, yeah. There'll be like there'll be a few characters in the middle that kind of know a bunch of different things and there'll just be like somebody off the corner just knows nothing. It's <laughs> like probably be like Hurley off by himself who just knows about the numbers, nobody else does. <laughs> but yeah, I think that's all I've got for this episode. Next episode is one called The Greater Good. And yeah. looks like it's going to focus on Said. Yeah, we get some side of the information and we get attempted acts of revenge okay so presume, yeah i mean presumably we're going to see jack try and hunt down Locke. good luck with that jack jack Locke's gonna have you if you try that on 
Um, as, uh, you, as you noticed, we have another another gun in the wild. Yep. Um, I'll just make the, make the comment. Is it interesting the fact that it's called the greater good? Because it's almost the exact opposite to the do no harm um, title of this episode. So they're, they're clearly going to be linked in some way, shape or form. Uh, yeah, cool. So that was do no harm. Bye bye, poor Boone. Bye bye, useless Boone. As a, our, our first, our first more than one hit point character to yeah. <laughs> to die, so to speak. And but, but we gained a new baby. Um, doesn't have a name yet, I don't think. Yeah, but... didn't get a name for it. Um, so. And you know, in terms of productivity, it's not a loss, is it? Like. Yeah. Baby or boon, like you know, it's about about even. Both required just about as much taking care of, I would expect. So, baby probably eats less. So, yeah, you know. get the baby in a papoose, give that to Locke, it will be a big boon. Yeah, he, he was able to build a crib if he can get himself a little pram that he can he can take the baby out to sort of look at his uh, hatch every every day. That was that was do no harm. Yeah, join us. Next time, we continue to encourage you to to watch along with us. Um, leave, leave comments, but try not to leave any spoilers for me. Yeah, no, no spoilers for Dan if you do leave a comment. 